Al Jazeera podcast. As this week comes to an end, we want to mark a moment of real tragedy for the Al Jazeera family. On Wednesday, our colleague Wa'il Al Dahdu lost several members of his family to an Israeli airstrike. He was live on air as it landed. It's clear there's a new strike on Gaza close to Wa'il al-Dahdouh. Wa'il, tell us what's happening. Yes, Layla, I can hear you. And he was live on air when he learned it killed his family. And in the hospital where he saw them. He's gone? (laughs) They take revenge by killing our children. It's okay. We belong to God and to Him we shall return. They were in central Gaza, where Israel had told people in the north to go to avoid airstrikes. Some of his family members survived. Some are still buried in the rubble. His wife, his son, his daughter, his grandson, and members of his extended family were killed. Today, through the eyes of his colleagues, we tell Watt's story about facing death to report through war. I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. Waj, welcome to The Take. Thank you, Malika, for having me. You need no introduction for most people, but just in case, can you tell us who you are and what you do? My name is Wajd Wakfi. I'm Al Jazeera's uh, correspondent at the White House, Al Jazeera Arabic. We were able to catch up with Wajd in a rare moment when she wasn't on air reporting. So I'm just basically right now on standby. I've been with Al Jazeera uh, reporting out of Washington and uh, other areas around the world uh, for 20 years now. Here in the United States and in Gaza during another war. In 2014, Israel was bombarding Gaza, uh, which uh, resulted in the killing of more than 2,300 Palestinians in 2014. So we were all basically sheltering in our office, me, Wael, and all other colleagues in Gaza. We were staying there. I joined them in the last three weeks of that war. And that's where Waj really got to know her colleague, Wa'il is the Gaza bureau chief. Right after I got there, I got a phone call from Wa'il. He told me, can you do this live shot for me? It's in 45 minutes. I just went through the uh, Eretz crossing. Mm. I was like, why? What happened? He said, I lost my cousin and I need to go to his funeral. That was back in uh, 2014. That was my first live shot in Gaza. So we know that the airstrike that killed our colleague Wa'il's family happened Wednesday night local time, which was the afternoon here in the U.S. for you and I are. Walk me through how you heard what had happened. Well, first I heard about it uh, from a colleague before it was announced. And my brain just did not want to believe it. It's not something that you can accept, you know. So I just kept denying it. I kept uh, denying until I saw it on Al Jazeera. And and this just it this is when it hit me and uh 
I mean, you, you, you feel, you feel that you're shaking from the inside because it's shocking because I know what El, uh, he cares for his family. And I know that what is family he did the Israeli warnings. And they went further south where the Israeli army said it would be safer for them. They uh, sheltered in a house at a relative's house, his family. That house, my colleagues from Gaza told me, had 40 individuals in it. Wow. They were all civilian, mostly men and women. Hmm. And uh, this is when the indiscriminate targeting of civilians came, happened by Israel and and four members of his family were lost, his wife, his son, his daughter, and his uh, grandchild, who was Adam, who was an infant. Mm -hmm. And he also lost uh, other members of his family. They were still searching under the rubble. So I'm not sure where they are right now, but... uh, one is, is a big number. It's shocking, really shocking, because when you're told that go to this mm-hmm. area, it's safer for you, and then you get you get bombed, that's very shocking. Mm-hmm. And while, when, when the Israelis um, uh, sent out these warnings to the Palestinians in Gaza to, to move from the north to the uh, southern part of Gaza, Wael uh, decided to stay behind because he wanted to report on the bombardment of Gaza. You see, Wael is a very courageous person, not only as a journalist person. I wanted to ask you about that because um, you know about Wael's courage. You worked closely with him in the Gaza Bureau in 2014. Can you tell us about that time and how you got to know him and his family? Of course. In the office, I met Wael. He has a very, very beautiful sense of humor. (laughs) He is very courageous. He's very compassionate and generous. You know, throughout the war, we had no food to eat. It's just whatever we could find to snack on. There was no water. I shared uh, some of my water share with the children that live in the same building where our office is because they, they, they had no water to drink. So this was the situation in 2014. After a few weeks, the, uh, there, there was a, a 48-hour truce. Well, without saying anything to any of us, he just disappeared from the office. And we were really worried uh, for his safety. Like, where did he go? And just to find out uh, two hours later that he walks in uh, to the office with bags of vegetables and and (laughs) meat and he starts cooking for us a hot meal. We're like, what What, what are you doing? He said, you guys, we never had hot meal for weeks now. Mm. And I just I just feel like, you know, having this dinner together, you know. Yeah. We have a break. For a few hours, let's just get our strength and uh, gather our strength and uh, have this uh, dinner together. So really, I mean, he always went out of his way Mm -hmm. in order to keep um, sanity in the place. You know, we saw dead bodies where I smelled death. I know how it it smells like. And for someone like me who has never, ever covered wars before, it was very um, uh, terrifying, you know. Yeah. Back then, his wife called me. And she called me just in 2014 just to apologize for not being able to invite me over for their house to have dinner together. Oh, wow. Because that's what people do. So this is... Let me make sure I have this straight. So this is the middle of an Israeli bombardment and you have just come in um, on your first day after going through the grueling process of getting through that checkpoint. You go to a live and Wael's wife eventually messages you that she is sad that she can't host you. Yes, because this is the tradition in Gaza whenever they have a guest Hmm. there. Wajd, um, at the top of your 
Twitter profile, you have a picture. Mm. Um, you and Wael and other colleagues. I take it this is from 2014 at that office? Correct, yes. Is this the same office that was later bombed by an Israeli strike? Absolutely. It's no longer there. It was bombed by Israel. See, I, I just want to talk about a diff- the difference between the 2023 war, what's going on now in Gaza, and the previous wars. Israel used to send these warning rockets uh, to civilians in Gaza, to families and homes. Most of the time, not all the times. In this war, they're not. They're not. I mean, why is family never got a warning? They thought they went into safe haven. They heeded the Israeli warnings and they moved to the what was supposed to be a safe zone. But still, they got targeted. After the break, as journalists, we never want to be the story. What happens when we have no choice? Thousands of Gazans have been killed by Israeli airstrikes now from this war. Well over 2,000 children. And one of the first things Wa'il said, live on Al Jazeera, as he was seeing his own family members in the hospital, was, they are punishing us with our children. It's also something that Safwat al-Kahlout, an Al Jazeera journalist in Gaza, repeated when he was broadcasting after the news came out. He knew that, they, they, you know, he would pay the, the price for reporting the truth. He is to stay in Gaza, in Gaza City, despite, despite the warnings to move to the south. But he insisted to do walk and talks live from the rubble, from all the bombarded areas. He remained with his team. He remained in, in our bureau. Despite the bombing, day and night. And Safwat raised some real questions about how this Israeli strike happened. They know every single house and they know who lives in these homes. So they know when Wael displaced his family in, in the central area and the Nusayrat refugee camp, they know very well who lives there and what is he doing. So, Wajd, what do you make of those words, Wa'al's words, the strength that it took to, to have that composure in the hospital, seeing the bodies of his family members, um, but they are punishing us with our children? What's your take? No one, no words can describe the, the pain and the sorrow and the horror, but it doesn't mean that they're not brave. It doesn't mean that they are not strong. It doesn't mean that journalists in Gaza are going to give up doing what they're doing. And I know that Wael is going to come back on the screen. Nothing's going to stop him. Two days before that, Wael survived a bombing near our office. He showed us a sharp nail this big. It was as big as his hand. This is a shrapnel part of the missile that targeted the nearby area. Thank God we were not hurt as it landed near our camera while we were reporting on the strikes. For me as a journalist in Gaza, knowing, uh, I would really, my, my thinking would be, oh, these are warning me, but I'm not moving. And I'm sure that's how Wael fought. And he kept reporting. In fact, he learned the news about the Israel's killing of his uh, members of his family while he was on air. I was watching, actually, Al Jazeera. And uh, and while was talking live, and all of a sudden, uh, he just moves away from microphone and he's talking on the phone saying, say what? What happened? Mm. We all heard that live on air as well. This is <laughs> This is a violent strike targeting the area near the building we're in. This is not the first time this area is targeted. This is the second time. You know, 
he chose to put his life on the line, but that didn't save his family. So, Wajd, you have reported on um, U.S. President Joe Biden's comments in which he said he does not trust the Palestinians when it comes to the number of dead in Gaza, which is now well over 6,000. I have no notion that the Palestinians are telling the truth about how many people are killed. I'm sure innocents have been killed, and it's the price of waging a war. I think we should be incredibly careful. And there are also reports that Al Jazeera is being or has been asked to tone down our coverage. We're learning that, uh, that the Biden administration just weeks ago efforted to have Al Jazeera tone down its coverage of Israel's war on Gaza. How are you reporting on all of this? Because as journalists, we never want to be the story. What do you see happening here? Well, in, in terms of the, the toning down, probably Al Jazeera was asked, but I was never asked to tone down. I don't know of any other colleague that was asked to tone down. Um, and uh, I know Al Jazeera will not do it, will keep doing what they're doing, which is getting the truth out through our cameras in Gaza and elsewhere. And no one has ever at Al Jazeera ever told me what to say or what not to say. We report what we hear and what we see. That's what I'm doing at the White House. And this is what Wael and other colleagues in Gaza have been doing for the past 20 days. They report what they see and they document what they see. And then I hear our president talking about what seems like a different war. I don't know, but uh, this is a president, I mean, that came with the slogan of human rights, humanity for all, equity. That's the, the President Biden that I know. And to be at the White House and uh, really not hear him being so sympathetic or compassionate with the Palestinian civilians, the children, the women that are dying every day is really heartbreaking. It's not enough to say, oh, this is, it's an ugly war. This is the cost of war. You know, we, we provide weapons to countries around the world. And when we do that, we need to tell people to be careful uh, to avoid killing children to avoid killing women, to avoid killing journalists. CPJ, Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, has estimated uh, that Israel killed 24 journalists in 20, as of the 25th mm. uh, of October. Wow. 24 journalists. That's a very high number in, in, in uh, less than 20 days. On Thursday, before we spoke to Waj, there were funerals for Wa'il's family members. Wael is still working, along with all the journalists in Gaza, including the rest of our colleagues. Just before this killing of his family, I saw Wael in the bureau. This is correspondent Yumna Al Sayed. She sent us this voice note. You can hear an Israeli drone flying in the background. He told me, Yumna, it's not safe. It's not safe in the South. It's not safe in Gaza City. There's no place in Gaza safe. He told me, I believe that. I took my family there to the South just so that I have done what I was supposed to do. But I don't believe that it's going to be safe. And he was right. It was not safe for them. It is not safe for us. It's not safe for anyone. Not here, not there. Wael is a big brother to all of us, not just a bureau chief. I know how strong Wael is. And I know how tough he is. And I've seen him broken. I saw him in pain. Losing his family like that. 
but I know. I know that this won't make Lyle retreat. It won't make him stop reporting. It's not going to break him for long. The sorrow will remain, the grief will remain, and the heartbreak will remain. But we will continue. We will continue reporting to the world until our last day. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Amy Walters and Sari Al-Khalili, with Ashish Malhotra, Chloe K. Lee, David Enders, Faranisa Kampana, Khalid Sultan, Miranda Lynn, Sonia Bagat, Zaina Badr, and me, Malika Bilal. Alex Roldan is our sound designer. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. And a heads up, I'll be passing the mic to my colleagues Natasha Del Toro and Kevin Hurton next week while I'm away, but I'll be back.